What's good, my dear language learning masters, and welcome to Natural Languages, and specifically, welcome to a new episode of the Language Input Podcast. And today, I'm going to have Bill Bamparen with me from California. Okay, and well, he he's going to tell us about all the research he's done when it comes to how the language acquisition process actually works. And he's also going to talk about facts, and I mean facts, <laughs> uh, on why comprehensible input is the way to go and why that's the way we all acquire our native languages and that's the way we adults acquire languages as well. So I believe this is going to be a tremendously useful episode for you. So yeah. With that being said, let's let's get right into it. Let's go. Hi, Bill. Hey, Alvaro. How are you today? I'm really good. You? I'm all right. Um, weather's getting a little weird. We had beautiful upper 70s, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, of course. <laughs> Uh, for the last couple of days, and now we dropped back down in the 60s, and it's cloudy and getting kind of gray here in Central California. So, okay, I think it's gloomy, but other than that, I'm okay. Okay, yeah, and you can actually you cannot control that. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's that? What's what's that expression? You know, learn 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 to live with the things you can't control, and then work to change the things you can. Exactly. Yeah. So. All right. So, well, welcome to the to the podcast. First of all, um, thank you. Happy to have you on. Thank you so I'm happy to be here. And yeah, as usual, just to get things started, just tell us a little bit about yourself, especially when it comes to languages, your experience with languages, like, you know. Okay. okay. Anything, um, you, anything you have in mind. <laughs> anything I have in mind. Well, for some people may know my background, some people may not. So um, uh, I'll start there. Um, I was raised in California. I was raised with two languages. My I have Mexican blood on my mother's side and okay. Midwest non-Mexican blood on my father's side. So I was raised with both languages here in California because I grew up in my mother's family, which was Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and then I learned French. I started learning French in high school and college, a little bit of Italian on the way. Um, and I wound up um, doing a weird thing. When I got to grad school, I realized that um, what I, the program was enrolled in was not a fit for me. Uh, I was actually doing Latin American studies at the time at the University of Texas. I had left California to go to grad school in Texas because they had a phenomenal, I think they still do, but in those days they had a phenomenal Latin American studies program, one of the largest libraries in the United States, if not the world with a Latin American collection. So I went there, realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. I got recruited in the Spanish department um, by somebody because I had a TA ship at the time, a teaching assistantship um, to support myself. And I didn't like the program that I was in there. And I thought, oh my God, what am I doing? I'm gonna go back to California. And this person who uh, turned out later on was my dissertation director and uh, I guess like a mentor during grad school said, have you ever thought about linguistics? I go, what's that? And because I went to a very small private school in California, we didn't, nobody did linguistics. I didn't know what linguistics was, right? Oh. Um, and so um, he says, yeah, try linguistics because you seem to have a scientific mind. And I want to kind of sort of do have a scientific mind. So I said, okay, I'll stay one more semester to see what it's like. So um, that spring semester, my first year in grad school, I switched over to, um, I guess you could call it Hispanic linguistics. It's broader than that, but Hispanic linguistics. Took three courses and I was hooked. Uh, then from then on, for my MMA PhD, I did coursework in Spanish linguistics, French linguistics, um, linguistics, linguistics, psycholinguistics, um, you name it. I did everything I could. And um, I think this was my second year, end of my second year of grad school, I took my first course in child language acquisition and linguistics department. And this was before I knew that there was such a field as second language acquisition, because in those days, I won't tell you how old I am. You can probably guess. <laughs> um, I never give away my age. Um, I'm like, I'm like Cher. I want to be eternally youthful, right? Um, so in those days, um, second language acquisition really wasn't a big field yet. It was just actually semi getting started in Southern California. 
And so I took this course on child language acquisition and I went, holy cow, this is so interesting. And it got me thinking about bilingualism, growing up with two languages. It got me thinking about second language acquisition because I was a teacher. Right. And so I developed a proposal to do some research with second language learners that was based on research that was done in first language, not knowing that some of that was already going on in Southern California. Long story short, um, I did the PhD program and I wound up with the, the PhD is actually from Spanish, but emphasis in linguistics and language acquisition. I was, think I was one of the first people to ever do hardcore language acquisition in that program sort of launched, you know, that I opened it up for other students who want to do this and then launched my career. My career got off to a rocky start and it's because a lot of people who were foreign language teachers and, and involved in foreign language organizations didn't want to hear what second language people had to say okay. because they thought it just went against their fundamental beliefs. And I really had a rocky start in my, in my career. Um, and, uh, I won't go into any details, but I prevailed. And I'd like to say, I don't want to say I did it single-handedly, but I was kind of instrumental in the United States of opening up Spanish, French, German, Russian, all these languages to second language acquisition saying, hey, mm -hmm. classroom learners are no different from any other language learner, whether you're in a classroom or not in a classroom, whether you're an ESL learner or a Spanish learner in um, Illinois, it makes no difference. Right. Um, yeah. And I kept pushing for this. And so on the next thing you know, here we have a big, huge, wonderful field of second language acquisition um, that developed in the 80s and 90s. And uh, now there's no distinction made between whether you're in the classroom or non-classroom, a learner is a learner is a learner. Um, so I'd like to think I had a little bit to do with that. And if you know my track record, I've published a lot. Um, I won't, if you, you know, if you want my CV, ask me for it, but <laughs> I published a lot. And yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever you want the audience to, to look at yeah. you know, website, podcast, whatever it is, you, you just let me know and I'll, I'll share them down yeah. below. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and the thing is that, that not only do I, do I work in theoretical stuff and research stuff, but I also wrote, I've always in a lot, I've always had one foot in the theoretical research side of things and one foot in the teaching side of things and helping teachers. And so I've also written about language teaching. I've written books for language teachers. I've written textbooks, materials, all kinds of things. So I was never, I was kind of weird. A lot, there are a lot of scholars in second language research who want nothing to do with teaching. They're very blunt. No, nothing to do right. with teaching. And then you've got a lot of people in language teaching who want nothing to do with second language acquisition research. Theory. And so I'm one of those weird people who's got one foot here and one foot there, and I, I think it would fit me just fine. So, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, and so that's a little bit about me. If you don't know that, now you know that. So, yeah, we're just thinking that they <clears throat> they actually go hand in hand, right? Like the research and then <clears throat> the application of it, right? Just that's uh, you, you do the research in order to help people learn the language right or in order to understand how the process works right so so right. you can help people actually acquire the language yeah. well yes and no i mean th there's a lot of second language research now that is the micro level that teachers don't need to know about it's uh, it would be right. an well, it could be interesting to them intellectually but it's uninteresting in the sense of of thinking about curriculum development and so on e everything that's insightful and that teachers want to think about We've kind of known since the 1980s mm -hmm. and I've done some pieces on that. I'll, I'll, um, there's a piece I published in the inaugural issue of, of the journal um, Instructed Second Language Acquisition, which is published out of London. And I believe that was 2017 that got published. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it talks about the field of Instructed Second Language Research and what it has to do with second language research more generally. And what are some observations? What are, I think there are five or six observations that we know just to be facts about language acquisition. And we've known those for, I don't know how long, right? Hmm. Um, and so that, that people have to grapple with these facts. And those are the things I think teachers need to know about. They don't need to know the field of SLA. They don't need to know all the details and the nuances, but they need to know what are the basic facts that right. are relevant to them. So, and I've been working a lot on those, that, those kinds of things for the last five to 10 years, just getting, trying to get that information in teachers' hands. Right. Yeah. Like this is the way the brain works, right? And this is how you're going to help your students. Yeah. Right. You, they don't need to get into to the specifics of it, like what, what, what actually goes on inside, but 
this is what you need and these are the facts so right so you know you're doing the right thing right yeah but it does but not this but i'm gonna i'm gonna say something here Alvaro, that that yeah. i think is important for teachers to hear and that's that even with these facts um they're not dicta they're not they're not maxims or they're not things that tell you how to teach or what you should mm -hmm. do they're insights so that you can make decisions for yourself because yeah. all, all teaching is ultimately local right and sometimes you have to make decisions about what you're doing they're unrelated to acquisition because you have pressures from administration or you have pressures from your institution and so it, it, teachers are stuck in that middle uh, so you get the insights you can make use of it and then you deal with your realities and so on right. um and so even though i might push from a certain direction and say here's what i would do and here's what my classes look like and so on right. but that might be different for you it might be different for another teacher right? Right. So. yeah it's more about just letting them know that to give you an example like comprehensible input is what students need in order to, to acquire the language right, right. so right. with that in mind then they're going to decide what they're going to use, but they're not right. going to force their students to speak when they're starting out, for example, right? So they, they know the general ideas and then they, they can use whatever they, they want to use to help. What, you're talk, what you just mentioned is really, is just what I was, it dovetails with what I was just talking about, these tensions between what we know and, and realities. Mm -hmm. Because one of the arguments I get from teachers about things like input and comprehensible input and input in the classroom is the following. Yes, I understand that, but I don't have a luxury because we have time constraints. Mm -hmm. So we only have three days a week or five days a week or whatever, and they have to master all this grammar before they go on and so on. <laughs> not understanding that, that we're not talking about mastering grammar and taking a test. We're talking about acquiring language. They're two different things, right? Uh -huh. And that's often, hard, that's often hard for teachers to understand that when you talk about the role of input, and whether it's comprehensible input or input more generally or input interaction, whatever it's input in some kind of communicative context, right? Mm -hmm. When you talk about input, um, teachers seem to walk away with the idea of what you're talking about is teaching the old stuff a new way. And that's not what we're talking about at all. In fact, right, right. We're, we're saying there's nothing to teach anymore. All that stuff that's in textbooks is unreal. It's psychologically unreal those grammar rules and those charts and lists those those are not ex what exist in anybody's head and they're never going to wind up in anybody's head because mm -hmm. it's not language right and so the idea is you've got to just if you're if you're going to understand comprehensible input and input more generally you have to understand that what the learner does with language in the head is is completely different from textbook rules charts and so on and, and and that's a hard thing for teachers to grasp and that's partly because they're caught in that tension of i got to teach all the grammar they got to get out of here knowing x and state standards might even tell them certain things and yeah. you know in the united states anyway um and so so what they try to do is make input be a technique so they can teach the old stuff as opposed to just get rid of the old stuff and saying i'm gonna do something completely different yeah yeah and then, then and then you wind up with complaints well input doesn't work well, yeah, it doesn't work because you're trying to teach with it. And that's not what input's about. <laughs> right. And that's not what acquisition is about. So, yeah, yeah that's that's beautiful because that's what I, I'm trying a lot of people to, I, I'm trying to get a lot of people to understand that yeah. I'm not talking about, you know, the newest technique or a method that you, uh, you know, a few people just came up with. It's just the way we all acquire our native languages, the way the language mechanism works, right? And Back to your example, in, in the adult world, that'd be the, the equivalent of someone who wants to learn a specific language as, as quick as possible because they, they need it for, for work or they want to move to a different country. So the, they're looking for shortcuts, right? But again, I understand you're, you know, for work or for whatever reason, you're in a hurry in order to learn the language, but it's just not going to work, you know. <laughs> there's no shortcut to learning the language. No, and there's, no, there's no shortcut to learning language. There are some shortcuts to learning some basic communicative events. I I can take one of these Rosetta classes or Babel or whatever you want to call them mm. for thirty days and get myself ready to go to a country for a week so that I can 
get my basic needs met and so on. Right. But that doesn't mean I've acquired those things. What I'm learning to is work with chunks of language. Mm. And those communicative chunks of the language are quite different from then what happens in our heads in terms of the way language evolves over time, right? Um, and so, uh, and we see the same thing in child language acquisition, by the way, the way children work with chunks and some phrases and bits of language with that they have, they have not analyzed them consciously or internally yet, right? Mm. Um, yeah, we can all do this at any age, but that's not language acquisition. That's just right. trying to perform some very specific communicative act, communicative act. Mm. Uh, and that's okay too. I mean, that, that's what you want to do. Um, but we have, we have to be careful that we don't confuse that right. with acquisition because acquisition is a very, very, very long process. Mm -hmm. I, let me, I'm going to say this for your listeners because I don't know if they've ever heard me say this or I put this in print in a couple of things too. Let's look at child language acquisition, right? Um, a child, we know now that child language acquisition technically begins in the womb, late in the womb. The, the fetus at, get at a certain point around about seven months or so, I, I got the months wrong, so don't, those of you who work in child language acquisition, don't, don't jump on me. <laughs> later, later in development, there's certain rhythmic patterns and sounds that the fetus is picking up from the environment, you know, through the womb, through the stomach wall, and so on. Um, so language acquisition actually begins there, but, but let's just forget about that. And let's forget about the first year when the baby's just lying there, squiggles, you know, and the hands are going like this and ga, 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 you know, and <laughs> let's, even though we know language acquisition is happening, now, let's just, let's just forget about that. Let's look up from year one, when the child actually, you might actually get a word out of the child or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so let's at year one, how long, how much time is involved in acquisition? By the time that the child is five years old, which is a typical age to go to school in the United States, but that child has amassed something like 14,000 hours of input and interaction with input with different people. And guess what? The child's still not done. There are lots of things in place, but at the age of five, there's lots of things that aren't in place. Um, a specific examples like passives, like, you know, the cow was kicked by the horse, those kinds of things, or Mary was kissed by John, those kinds of passives aren't in place for a child at the age of five. And we don't see them firmly in place till about the age of eight. And then there are other things, even the past test system in English, there's, a f there's parts of it that are missing in the child's language at the age of five, right? Um, and so I could go on and on, there's other things. And then there are other things that keep developing and we've got evidence in a variety of languages that there's some stuff that's not adult-like until the child is like 12 or 13. So you have to imagine that's a long haul. So you can think in years from one to 12, and go, oh my God, that's like 10, 11 years. But think of it in terms of hours. And the right. reason I tell people think in terms of hours is because when you deal with second language learners and you think in years, a second language learner is not engaged in language acquisition eight or nine hours a day like a child. That person's engaged one hour a day if you're right. And maybe with a little work outside of class, depending, maybe, you know, one and a half, two hours a day, mm -hmm. total, right? Yep. How long is it going to take that second language learner to amass the thousands and thousands and thousands of input interaction that a child gets to become a, a competent and fully fluent speak knower and speaker of a language? It just takes a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but like you were saying earlier, people want shortcuts and that, that's one of the things we know. There are no shortcuts. It, it takes time yep. and um, people just like to fool themselves that it, that it doesn't. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but I also like to say that the good news is um, you, you don't need that long in order to be able to understand different resources. So I, I myself, I love language, uh, learning languages and I'm not in a hurry. First of all, because I know it's not going to work, and then because I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm in no hurry because I need it for work or whatever. But so I really enjoy the process of watching a series or listening to podcasts in different languages. And even though I might not be able to communicate at that level yet, but after a shorter period compared to that you were talking about, I, I can enjoy a lot of different resources because I know input comes first, right? So 
you know, I, I, I can get exposed to an hour or two of a language a day and I'm okay with it because I'm, I, I'm patient. I, I know it's going to happen because it's a natural process. I'm, I'm already enjoying the process because I'm, I get to watch uh, original series in French or, or, or listen to a podcast in Portuguese about a topic that I'm interested in, right? So it's not that it's going to take you 10 years to start enjoying the, the language, if that makes sense for an adult, right? Right, exactly, exactly. And, and I think that what teachers need to recognize is that they have captive learners in their classrooms. But language as a tool, both as an instrumental tool and as a social tool, um, isn't the learner is in control of his or her motivation and disposition along with all the internal things that make language acquisition happen, right? And mm -hmm. so um, I'm like you, for example, I, I, I've got advanced work in French um, as part of my MA and my PhD, right? I, I'm, I'm not that good at French. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good and I, I'm happy with what I have in French. Right. And no teacher should impose on me what my goal should be. Right. That it should be this right here. Um, and, but that's what we tend to do, at least I'm, in university programs, we do this um, in the US. The idea is that this is, this is what we are and this is what our goals are, so they should be your goals. Right. Um, and unfortunately, that, that doesn't work for a lot of language learners because they're, yeah, I'm not like that, so. Yeah. Yeah, this is a lot of things. And I, I was just thinking, so, you, you pretty much were convinced by the by the comprehensible input theory from the get, right? Because you you said you were already trying to convince teachers when you started, right? Was it because of your linguistic studies or your bilingual background, or why why was that? It it, it started to happen as um, I got more and more involved in um, looking at what learners do with language over time. My MA thesis, for example, was on the acquisition of sentence that in Spanish. Those of you who don't speak Spanish, there's two verbs in Spanish that are like mm -hmm. be. And uh, in, in most contexts, they don't overlap. They have different functions. There's only in a couple of contexts we, we can actually use both verbs and you have to sort out why and so on. And so I was the first person to document stage and acquisition of how these verbs develop in learners over time as part of my MA thesis. And, um, and since then, there's been lots of work done. I continued that work. Other people continue that work. 2010, I wrote a review article in España, the journal that's published in the United States. If you want to look that up, it's again, 2010. Mm -hmm. it summarizes what's going on with that, which was said in the staff. But it was that initial work I did way back in my MA thesis that made me go, because I was smacking in all my studies and I didn't know I didn't I have all my linguistics yet and I have all my psycholinguistics yet and so on. But it was looking at those patterns of development and learners that made me go, they are doing something to language completely independent of what's going on in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. By classrooms, I meant their textbooks and their, because th in those days, learners were largely, um, <clears throat> it was learn your grammar and so on, but there was some conversation. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the more I looked at what was going on, I could see that their, their language mechanisms were picking pieces and parts of stuff out of the communicative data they were getting in the classroom. As impoverished as it was, it was there, right? Mm -hmm. Or readings yeah. they had in their textbooks. Right. And they were constructing a system of sentence that over time um, that had nothing to do with what they were learning in textbooks. Yeah. And I also, because I also noticed the following. What else, one thing they were doing is they were also picking up chunks in the um, in the community input. So even though the earliest stages, for example, the, the first stage of the active set of stat, you, you'll see it a lot of learners, is they just leave the verb out. So instead of saying, you know, Juan, Juan es alto, for example, you know, so John is tall, they say Juan alto. They just don't mm -hmm. put a verb in, right? <laughs> or uh, Maria no aquí, you know, that's how they say it in their Spanish one on the side, Maria no aquí. So instead of saying, Maria no está aquí, they would just say, Mary, not here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but at the same time that they were doing that, you could see that they had a tenseless system without verbs and they were there. The beginning of their language system was doing something 
independently or something. But at the same time, they had chunks like, ¿Cómo estás? They had no idea what that was, but they knew that's how you asked how somebody was. Right. Right. So they could, so I thought they're picking that out of the input as well. And they, some communicative interchange in the class, they're picking these chunks out that, you know, occur over and over and over again and incorporating it as a lexical item. So I saw a grammatical stuff developing and I saw chunks developing as like big lexical items. And that was when I first started to think about they're pulling stuff out of the environment and doing something with it. And then along about that time, um, who, when Krashen first launched his input hypothesis in the late seventies. Um, and so I was, I was right there, you know, <laughs> thinking about some similar things, um, while he came along and did so by the time he pu started publishing his work and so on. And I saw him, oh yeah, that's what I want to talk about. That's yeah, that's it. So, um, and, and then the more you get involved in looking at second language data, um, from all different kinds of language and you see these commonalities of, of what learners do, yeah. you go, yeah. Yep. Input, they're pulling stuff in the input. Right. Yeah, I was curious because pretty much everybody has had the same experience when it comes to languages, you know, in school, high school, college, and so on. So it takes yes. it takes curiosity to, <laughs> to to get into a different path, right? Yeah. It, it does. It does. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so yeah, so that, that that's how the whole idea of input stuck with me and, and I've never abandoned it. And, mm -hmm. and I, I got in trouble for pushing the role of input in my career early on because people, teachers didn't want to hear it. And major organizations in the United States didn't want to hear it. It didn't go with what they were spouting. Right. Times have changed. <laughs> yeah. And, and I always talk about the, the internet because, you know, now for whatever the topic, we're talking about languages here or any topic, you have different opinions, different ideas. And so they're, they're out there, right? Back in that day, I guess, if, if, if that, that was the, the most dominant approach and you didn't really know an alternative, right? And most people, I mean. Right, right. And, and, and that's the issue with, um, uh, I don't say the issue, that might be a too harsh word, but that's one of the conundrums, I should say, I guess, of, of language teaching is, just how much basic information is not given to teachers so they can actually think about stuff, right? Um, and it's it's a fault in the way, at least in the United States, teachers are educated and trained pre-service and then their post-graduation professional development things they get to. Um, again, that's changing in some places and in some manners. Um, but there are still forces. I watch things happen in the United States with national organizations, regional organizations, where they inadvertently reinforce old ideas, not knowing that that's what they're doing. They think they're doing something different, but they're really not. Yeah. And the problem you have in language teaching then is that because these basic things are not well known from research, then everybody's opinion matters. Because you can have an uninformed opinion, and my uninformed opinion is just as important as your uninformed opinion. So, yeah. <laughs> and and, that, and again, and and it's not to discount teachers' experiences either, because that's a separate thing. I understand. I get that. Yeah. You know, my experience is. I get that. Um, but don't forget that your experience is your experience. It might be different from somebody else's experience, and your experience is confined to the beliefs you have and what you think you're doing. So if you think that grammar is important, and so you teach it, and then you see, it looks like learners master it, that reinforces your belief mm -hmm. and your experience. Um, but if I, if I took your learners out of your classroom and tested them the way a linguist does, a researcher does, what they're doing in your class will not show up in my research, I can guarantee you. Sorry. Um, and so your experience, are it's a psych of self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway. Yeah, um, you, you don't even really need to know the, the linguistic or research route. You just you try to have a conversation with one of those students. That's, you know, there's no, I always talk about that. There's no way to fake fluency, right? <laughs> right, right. I, I talk about that in the, in the context of, you know, like job interviews and things like that, that you know, just talk to the other person. There's no way to fake fluency, right? <laughs> anyway. 
So yeah, I wanted to ask you because you've talked about it a little bit, but so what are some of those facts that you were talking about or some, uh, when it comes to, to comprehensible input being the way or, or being the way we actually acquire our native languages. So if you can talk about that, you know, uh, even it's just a little bit or two. I, I'll, I'll give you a few. I'll give you a few. Yeah. Okay. Um, from, I have to do this off the top of my head because they're written down somewhere, right? I used to talk about five or six. Yeah, like I, can, I can probably talk about three right now coherently. Okay, like little nuggets. Um, yeah. One is that um, what you think the learner is learning is not what you think the learner is learning. Mm -hmm. In other words, the learner creates in his or her head a very abstract and a very complex unconscious mental representation of this thing we call language mm -hmm. that bears no resemblance to textbook rules, charts, and so on. So in other words, what a learner is doing is creating a system in much the same way native speakers create a system when they're learning a first language. That doesn't mean the systems are the same, they look alike, but they're creating equally abstract and complex systems. And, but teachers aren't trained to look for those. They're trained to look for, can they give me the past tense of the verb? Can they give me the first person singular of the verb? Can they give me this case ending in this test I'm giving them? That's what they're trained to look for. And if, and if I do simple conversations with them and I ask, you know, um, uh, who did you see yesterday? And the answer is, oh, I saw my friend. And if I don't put the right case ending on friend, accusative case ending on friend, because it's the object of saw, then I'm concerned as a teacher, right? Because that's what I think I'm focused on. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that all these things, that, that what exists in our heads is much more complex and abstract than that and quite unconscious, quite unconscious. Um, and so um, the, the first finding is that or the first nugget, I guess, if you want to call it that, is learners create an abstract, complex, unconscious mental representation language the same way native speakers do. Again, it doesn't mean the systems are the same. It means what they're trying to create is the same. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's one thing. Um, so that means what's in textbooks is just not really <laughs> going to wind up in your head. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the um, second nugget we've already talked about, that input um, that's embedded in communicative acts is indispensable. It's the necessary ingredient for language acquisition, right? And the corollary to that is it should be comprehensible because if, if it's not comprehensible, it's just noise. Okay. So the idea is that learners need access from the very beginning and all along the way, all throughout language acquisition, not just the beginning, not just the middle, not the end, all through acquisition, they need access to language in communicative contexts that they can comprehend, right? Um, and I, I like to say a co corollary of that is learners need to interact with that input. What I mean by that is that learners aren't little passive sponges that you talk at. So if you're a classroom teacher, it means you talk with, that you expect learners to be engaged. That doesn't mean learners are speaking in full sentences or learners are um, demonstrating knowledge. That means they're responding somehow. They're going, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. or no. Or if, if you ask them a question about who did something, they just shout the person's name out, Avaro, Avaro. Yeah. You know, you want, that shows you that they are interacting with the input in the mm -hmm. classroom, right? Or they're drawing something, or they're raising their hands, or in other words, they're not sitting there, right? Um, and so learners must somehow be actively involved um, in the development of whatever it is that's going on in the classroom, that's the communication that's going on. Yep. And it's only as language progresses over time that learners can be more linguistic about their interaction and put words together and do things, right? Um, so so, so that, that's the first nugget, the second nugget. The third nugget is acquisition. We talked about this earlier. Acquisition takes time. It's slow and it's piecemeal. And by piecemeal, I mean that this is one of the best kept secrets from teachers. Teachers think, for example, like, okay, in Spanish, um, you learn the present tense, you learn the preterite tense, you learn the imperfect tense, you learn this, you learn that. People think that's actually how language acquisition happens. It's not how it happens. Mm -hmm. 
it takes learners a long time to get in Spanish the present tense under control with all the person and brandings, right? Um, and so what we've seen over time, um, and, and not just in Spanish, you can document this other language as well, is there seems to be at least a three-stage process over time just to get basic endings on verbs in Spanish. The first stage is usually what's called a bare verb. So if those of you don't know Spanish, like comer, for example, as we call that the infinitive, means to eat. Vivir, for example, means to live. Um, and tomar, for example, means to drink or to take. It, it's it's it, depending on your English translation of the verb. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, so what learners use in the early stages is toma, come, vive for everything. Now, to teachers, that looks like third person singular, but technically it's not. Linguistically, it's not. Vive, toma, and, and come. Or what we call bare verbs, they actually don't have any endings. And Spanish just happens to use them for the third person by historical accident. But okay. technically, they have no person number endings at all. And so learners figure that out unconsciously from the input. And because there's no person number ending that doesn't clash with anything, so they can say, yo vive, you know, sotros vive, and, and, uh, and el quiere come, you know, for he wants to eat. I mean, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, they'll use those bare verbs everywhere because they can't. Um, and then what creeps in the next stage are the singulars, first person singular and second person singular. So then you start to get the como for I eat and the tomo for I drink or take or whatever. Um, and then you also get that point, get the, the tomas and the comes for you eat and you drink and so on. And then after that, you start seeing creep in the plurals. And usually it's the um, third person plural, like the comen and the toman in Spanish for they eat, they drink. But not all the time. So we just put these as a, a group. Yeah. yeah. But I, I've looked. I've looked at recordings from my students. I looked at stuff over time, and I've looked at some of the research that shows um, error clashing in psycholinguistic research of Spanish learners. And um, it seems to be that that third person plural seems to come a little bit sooner than the other ones. So the the we and the you all forms of the verbs come in later. So that's happening over time. In the meantime that's going on, the stage development, you're also getting stage development in the past tense. So, so while learners in that vive come stage, they're he hearing past tense forms as well in the input, um, or even through instruction to a certain extent, because instruction highlights that, and then they start hearing the input or seeing the input. And what learners, the first stage that learners in Spanish get, for example, is the idea that there's a stress shift so in Spanish, anything that's present tense, whether it's indicative or subjunctive or anything else, the stress falls on the stem of the verb. If it's not present tense, it goes on the end of the verb somewhere. So that's both for past okay. and future and conditional, those kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. And past subjunctive and so on. Um, uh, but I, because, I, I, I didn't know that myself, but uh, yeah, let's go on. <laughs> so, so the past, so the past, so the past, for example, the past is more frequent than anything else of those other ones. So it's present is the most frequent, the past is the most frequent. Then after that, everything else drops off to like 5%, 3% of the input and so on. So it's natural for them to, to pick Q in on the past. So what you start getting while they're doing vive and come, and they might start to get the, the como and tomo creeping in, then you start to get the vive for, and the como, <laughs> you know, things like that, because they're trying to, they, 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 their system is creating, ah, there's tense in the system and there's a stress shift. And so they take what they have and, 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 they, and they start to do that, right? And that's why they also start, when they start to learn irregular, uh, irregulars, they start to regularize the word like tuvo for he has the tuvo, right? Um, so anyway, so my point is that these things take a long, long time. They're piece, piecemeal and they're stage-like. And we have hundreds of examples of this across all kinds of languages. This is a universal phenomenon, right? And so teachers need to understand that learners are going to do that in their heads um, because that's an important insight because then it makes you think how you're going to deal with non-native like productions and structures in your classroom. So when a learner does that, what do you do with it, right? That's for you to think about. But you have to know that's going to happen and, and kind of why it happened. Not necessarily why it happens, but that it's a natural phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this whole idea of stage development, piece in the development, and the length of time it takes back to happen is an insight that teachers need to have. 
So yeah. I think I just gave you three, if not four. So there you go. How's that? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> now, those are, those, those about, are very basic things that teachers need to grapple with, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's what I mean at the beginning of, of, of the talk, like basic thing. Yeah, yeah. But I, I was just thinking about a little example with English. Like I personally, I can perfectly communicate in English. I've, you know, I've been exposed to thousands and thousands of of, of hours of comprehensible input in English. And even though I perfectly understand the, the what I'm gonna talk about, I perfectly understand the rule from a conscious standpoint, I, I'm gonna talk about, you know, saying his or her. I'm, I'm perfectly aware that his means uh, you know, I'm talking about a man, a man or a boy or masculine, a hair for, for a woman or a girl. You know, I'm perfectly, but even then, when, I, when I'm speaking like uh, in, in, in real time, sometimes I use his when I, 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 I use, I, I, I had to use her or, or the other way around, right? Yeah. Even like little things like that, that they're so obvious from a conscious standpoint, right? But it's just not how it works. <laughs> yeah, 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 and that, yeah. Um, and we see those in advanced speakers of English too, um, not just early stage learners. I mean, people who are well advanced, like yeah. you're saying, like yourself, you're you're an excellent speaker of English. Um, and my guess is you're an excellent knower of English. You got a lot of unconscious knowledge about English in your head too. Yeah. But even then, these things just happen, right? Yeah. Um, they just do. Yeah. Or, or people actually being perfectly able to communicate in English, but still saying he won't, for example, even though they're perfectly aware of the need to add an S if you're right. talking about the third person singular, right? Right. Again, from a conscious standpoint, yeah, it doesn't right. mean that you're going to be able to produce it. Yeah. And some of those things, some of those things though, like that one you just mentioned, just to point out to people how complex language is, there are interfaces between components and like, look at the English system because it's very revealing compared to some other languages. Um, that languages overall don't like consonant clusters at the ends of syllables. Um, so look at language like Spanish or Chinese or others. You know, you get you 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 either have open syllables that end in vowels or maybe one one consonant, right? And then there's a handful of consonant clusters that seem to be universal that languages tolerate. Um, because what they do, like, um, like want, whenever you have a, mm, like a nasal, because that, when you have consonants that, that don't, that have like duration, like, mm, it's not like t that just, you okay. know, it's, right. That, which is called a stop consonant. You have mm, a nasal, for example. So you can get want because you have a vowel leading into a nasal, which has duration, which then allows you to, to go into the t sound from want. But now look, you have to have the S. So now you have a N, a T, and an S that have to come together as a consonant cluster. Most languages don't have that kind of consonant cluster. And so what happens with learners is in their mental representation and the phonologic representation, the interface between morphology and syntax and phonology, they know there's a consonant cluster there. But the spell out, the pronunciation falters sometimes and they leave it off because mm that's something separate from what actually exists unconsciously in their heads. It just does. And because we see it all the time where because of the way they'll vacillate, when you get learners, they'll vacillate. Sometimes they'll put something on. And when you look really carefully at what they do, you can start to see, oh, that's because this consonant cluster is a little easier than that. Con so they're putting it there, but they're not putting it here. Just things like that, for example. Mm -hmm. So people have to understand how complex language is. So Adding S on the end is, 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 is not a, a rule in of itself because it's part right. of this phonological structure of English of how consonant clusters work. So anyway, yeah. there you go. No, Too no, much no, no, wonderful, know, but. wonderful. wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and when, when it comes to your own uh, journey, are, are you learning any languages now or are you trying to get your friends to a different level or? No, not really. I'm, I'm happy with where I am. Um, I, uh, I've, I've worked with some other languages with students and done research on them. So I picked up a little bit about Japanese here and there, a few words working okay. with people of Japanese and some other things. I took, I took two semesters of Quechua oh. in graduate school because I had to take a non, 
I had to take like a weird language, right? To, because <laughs> you have to experience that as a linguist to really see. Okay. Kitsch was what's called a glutenative language. It's like Turkish uh -huh. where you just keep adding ends to words to make a sentence, right? Um, and uh, it also has a, a few weird sounds compared to a language like English from my from a L1 perspective, right? Or Spanish for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you that because of the way it was taught through the anthropology department and what they did, of course, was what a lot of places do at universities is, oh, we got this anthropology PhD student who's from Peru and he speaks Quechua, so we're gonna have him teach this class for us. Guy knew this about language teaching, this <laughs> about language, this about communication, and he didn't know what he was doing. Long story short, I took two semesters at Quechua and I, all I remember is the word for armadillo. <laughs> um, and, and so I can't say a word Quechua, I can't even remember anything Quechua, I can't even remember anything because it was just also focused on going through this workbook of rules and learning where I was just so dumb in oh. retrospect. Um, Sounds so I thought, do I want to, do I want to go like learn that, that kind of language again? And I go, no, I got other things I need to do right now. So, uh, in French, what I do with French is I, um, I watch movies now and then in French, I, I'll be on Netflix probably about once a week. I'll just look for a French movie and I'll watch it. And sometimes I have to watch it twice because French comprehension for me is still kind of tough. I don't know how it is for you, but it's, it's got some, talk about some weird phonological stuff and pronunciation right. of the question. It's like, yeah, okay. So you're watching the original series from... Yeah, original, original things, yeah, original movies, French for French speakers, not anything mm -hmm. that's for foreigners, so... Right, because there's one thing that, um, pr not anymore, but when I'm in sort of an intermediate stage, when it comes to my ability to understand, I'm not talking, again, I'm not talking about output. So one thing I found helpful is if I'm learning French, for instance, instead of watching a movie in like original movie from France, I watch an American series dubbed into French. Okay. So, I mean, I understand people don't like that uh, movies in general. And I mean, if it's dubbed into your own native language, I understand that, right? But that sort of little trick really helps me when I'm on intermediate level because you know, when, when a movie is dubbed, they tend to speak a little bit slower or it's it's more clear, you know, as, as opposed to to the original right. version of it, right? So that that helped me. But but yeah, with French, I mean it, it depends on the kind of, of resource, of course. Like movies are always some of the hard things, harder things to understand, right? But I there's there's um sort of a documentary or like a TV program in which, like a typical travel program in which, uh, you know, they, they travel to to another country, they visit some some French people living there or French speaking people living there. And, you know, they show you the country, it's called Echappé Belle. It's re really good. And I, I remember when, when, when I was in that sort of intermediate stage, I could understand what was going on, but you know, I, I had some issues with it. But now I can I can watch it and understand pretty much hundred percent of it. But again, the, the key and the, the the like last little thing is that I know how it works. I'm patient. I know you know all I need is to keep keep getting comprehensible input, right? And you know, it's 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 not a hard thing because I'm enjoying it. I'm watching movies. I'm listening to I'm listening to podcasts and and things of nature, right? So, and I know it's a natural process, so it's gonna come, right? right. <laughs> what are, what are the things? One of the you talk about tricks with with what you you, say, you watch the movie dubbed. Um, what I'll do is I'll watch an original French movie, but I watch it with the subtitles. And what I'll do is I'll watch the movie all the way through, so I get the basic plot and stuff. And then what I'll do sometimes, not all the time, but I do this, I, I guess I do it frequently enough. And this is my acquisition exercise for myself, is I pick a scene, like a five minute scene that I liked. Mm -hmm. And I watch it over and over with the subtitles and listening. So, and then I try to get to the point where I turn the subtitles off. 
and I watch the scene until I get to the point where I can understand that particular scene without the subtitles. It sounds all right to me and I can hear the words, I can hear the, the phrases and so on, the pitch contours and I just I go, okay, that's what they're saying, that's what they're saying, that's what they're saying. Um, and because um, I like to work in little chunks like that. Um, mm -hmm. and so. That, that's one little trick I use for So, I mean, we were both giving people out there listening. If you want tricks for watching other <laughs> movies to help you, it's like, there's two, two you just got two. Yeah, yeah. His works for him, mine works for me. I'm going to try it, and he's going to try mine at some point. We'll see how it goes. So. <laughs> yeah, there's a, another little one that I use sometimes is on YouTube. Uh, again, it depends on the language, on the level you're at, but on YouTube, there's, you know, you can you can change the speed of the video, right? that you can slow it down a little bit or speed it up. And the, the good thing about YouTube, um, at least on, on desktop, you can, because, you know, you have to, you have, you actually have a bar that you can um, like customize it for yourself. So, because if you go to 0 0.5, they speak like that and it's, it's awkward, right? But you, you have that bar that you can, you know, just take it a little bit down to 0 0.9, 0 0.95, which it just slows down a little bit, just enough for you to, or, or just enough to help you understand what's going on. Right. But it's still natural, right? So that, that helps, especially in beginner intermediate stages where you don't have access to more complex and interesting resources yet, like movies or, uh, series or podcasts that that that's how me as well yeah <laughs> yeah I, I, I never thought about that but that's true you can do that on youtube so yeah this is see this is why we talk to people find things out so yeah because it used to be you, you you only had the option to slow down to 0 0.75 or 0 0.5 or speed it up to 1.5 or 2x right but certainly on desktop I don't know on, on mobile, but you have that whole bar that you can just move it across a little bit. It really helps. And yeah, I also wanted to ask you because I, I've seen that, well, not that you've taken a turn, but that besides your language teaching and research, you started to, to write novels, right? Oh yeah. And yeah, yeah I mean, I, you can tell us about that, but I, I'm curious because I really like creating stories, the, the part about creating stories in my classes and YouTube videos and so on. So I was wondering if the language background really led you into, into writing novels right now, into creating stories, or is it a part of the process? No, not really. I mean, I've always engaged in some kind of creative work with stories. I remember we had to do a creative writing thing in the fifth grade it was. And that's when I wrote my first story ever. And the teacher liked it so much, he read it out loud to the class. And went, oh my God, I was like, you know, I was that nerdy, nerdy smart kid. And every time the teacher singled the act, when I'm not gonna beat me up in a recess when I'm outside. <laughs> so he read my story out loud. And so off and on, I dabbled in that, right? Um, when I took up music, and then a lot of people don't know that um, when I lived in Chicago, when I was teaching at the University of Illinois at Chicago, I started taking stand-up um, comedy. I, I took acting classes before, and I, I took up stand-up comedy. And stand-up comedy, you were creating your stories. Remember, stand-up comedy is not like acting, where it's somebody else's words, and you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're learning how to take those words and project them out to people. Um, stand-up comedy is you. It's your thoughts, your ideas. <laughs> you know, you got to put it all together, and you got to go perform it. Um, so it's a very creative act that way, and it's, and it's kind of storytelling in a way. Yep. And then I got into, um, uh, when I was at University of Illinois, um, I got involved in Urbana-Champaign, I got involved with the Destinos Project, which a lot of people know in the United States. It launched in 1992. It was a 52-episode telenovela in Spanish for learners, for students. Oh. And so I was a co-author of every, all 52 episodes. Um, and that just reminded me how much I liked creating and doing things. And, mm. um, and then I did Soliviento in Spanish, um, which is a movie uh, from McGraw Hill for students. 
And then my colleague, former student and colleague, Winnie Wong, who's at Ohio State University, who, who, does, who teaches French, she's a French professor. Um, we approached some companies and developed the Project Liaison, where she and I co-wrote the scripts in French for the movies. So there I was again in storytelling um, in, in that mode. And, um, and I always use stories in my classes. And so I started doing creative writing actually when I was teaching at Texas Tech. That's when I picked up the actual putting my fingers to the keyboard and putting stories on a page mm. for consume for English speakers, for, you know, consumers okay. of English stories. Right. Yeah. And so, or English language stories, I should say. Um, and I've just been doing it ever since. And then I started my first novel there and then I finished it in East Lansing. Um, and uh, I've been Michigan. writing ever since. Yeah. And then I sort of, when I left academia, I've just been, as I said, poco a poco, I'm saying, bit by bit, I've been transitioning myself to writing fiction full time. So that's kind of what I do now. So, All right. Yeah. Well, my first cool. novel, I'm going to give myself a plug. My first novel, Sidon's Tale, um, won a prize, an award in 2019. It's called the Cops Featherling International um, Silver Phoenix Award for Best yes. New Voice in Fiction. So I was really pleased with that. Awesome. Um, so can I, can I get a plug for my website for people? Yeah. If you want to know more about, if you want to know about what I'm doing, that's not academic. <laughs> um, you can find my academic stuff just by Googling stuff me on, online, right? But if you want to know more about my fiction stuff, go to, it's billvanpatten.net, all one word, B-I-L-L-V-A-N-P-A-T-T-E-N.net. Go to billvanpatten.net. That's my website for being an author. Awesome. And there's yeah. some free short, if you want to read in English, there's some free short stories that you can just download and read from there that don't cost you anything, so. Awesome, yeah, I'll leave the link down below, just in case. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's wonderful, because like stories in general, they're just so fundamental in our in daily lives, right? So I, I was just wondering, because I've noticed that I really like the process of creating stories, for, like I said, for my classes, improvising them in, in our classes or creating them for YouTube. And I really like that creative process. And obviously, you know, if, if you're creating them in order to help people learn your language, you need to adjust. Of course, you, you, you can't really get, you can't really use that, lit, you know, literary um, vocabulary as much, right? <laughs> As, you know, as opposed to what you're doing now with your books that you're, you know, just writing them in English for, for English speakers, right? And I, and I have done also, I started doing stories in Spanish for heritage speakers and second language learners. Um, if you go to another site, inputandmore.com, that's input and more, all in word.com. Mm -hmm. um, I have this series, it's called Bridge Literature. It's for like intermediate level, going toward advanced learners of Spanish or heritage learners who are trying to get literate. I have a series, um, called, it's called the Bridge Literature Series. So you're not ready to read Cien Años de Soledad, for example, or Lonely Heart, <laughs> but you want something good to read that's sort of targeted at your level. Right. Um, that's the series. The first one is called um, Angel. The second one is called Elena. The third one is called Daniel. I'm supposed to be writing the fourth one called Gloria, but I've been so immersed in writing my novels, I have, I have to like push myself to get back to it because there's supposed to be four in that series. And they're kind of neat stories because they, they're, they're long stories. They're like 7,000, 8,000 word stories, but they're little ch baby chapters. So for language learners and for heritage speakers who are just learning to get literate or in, in their in, in a home language, um, it's just the right length to deal with every night. If you got a little bit of homework to do with it, because each chapter turns to be like seven or 50 or a thousand words. Yeah. That's doable. Right. Um, and so, so those are those stories. And then for beginning and early stage and immediate learners, I developed these stories called Cuentos Cortos, mm. which is flash, flash fiction. And that's little, this is hard to do out of what I'm telling you for the, the, the stories have to be less than 450 words, self-contained. Okay. Um, but they're using, they've got some universities and, and places and a couple of high schools who are using them because they're nice and short and they also have activities with them so that, you know, you can use them again with language learners. So I, I'm, I'm writing in Spanish. In fact, my neighbor across the street, Erica Perez, 
her husband Domingo, I love her, her husband Domingo Pedro because my grandfather's name is Domingo, even though his last name was Trujillo, but my grandmother's maiden name was Perez. Uh -huh. And so I tell him, you're like, you're like my grandfather and my grandmother put together. So she reads all the time and she read my first novel, loved it. She goes, you anything else? I go, yeah. I go, I got another novel coming out, but I'll get it to you in, you know, in, um, you know, when it comes out. But in the meantime, if you want to read something in Spanish, I've got these. She goes, I love those. So I give her those. She stopped me when she read Angel first. And she stopped me when she was pulling out a driveway. She goes, Bill, I think you write better in Spanish than you do English. I go, no, 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 I don't. I don't. But, but thank you for the compliment. <laughs> I, I guess, right? <laughs> like, is it a compliment on my Spanish or, or, the, or you know, the opposite of my English? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know, but, so, but anyway, so I thought it was cute. So, but, so even, even some, she's a, again, she's a heritage speaker, grew up bilingual like me. So she enjoys reading things like that. And for her, it was just a great language. She would read them to her kids out loud, at, you know, mm -hmm. they sitting around, just three younger kids. And so, so, yeah, so I do that too. So I just, I just love putting, it's like painting. You're putting images on paper and you're putting, yeah. you're, you're putting things that people can try to envision their heads while it's going on. Mm -hmm. and so, yeah. And such a great way to learn language as well. Like on the other side of things, it just, like whenever I'm reading a book or, or watching a movie or, you know, just listen to a story in, in a foreign language. It, it, it almost gets you to that point in which you kind of forget that you're listening to a different language. Of course, it needs to be comprehensible as usual, right? But once that criteria is met, you kind of forget that you're listening to, to a different language and you, you're actually acquiring the language without you even noticing, which is ideal, right? <laughs> Um, by the way, you, you talked about Perez. I, I, I got Perez in my family as well. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's... Yeah. Actually, yeah. My, my grandma on my mom's side, she had four Perez. <laughs> four Perez. Like, she was called Irene Perez, 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 Perez. Like, four consecutive Perez. <laughs> so and, my, and you, know, you know where Perez comes from, right? Where that name comes from? Not sure. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it actually means son of Pedro. Ah, okay. It is. Yeah, the EZ was an ending used, and I forget which Iberian mm -hmm. language that was spoke at the time. They combined it with Pedro. So, so it was like, like Pedres. It was like Pedres, and then it got shortened to Pedres because those, vr, you know, those are hard. Right. Again, right. consonant clusters. We try to reduce consonant clusters. So Pedres, oh. we can. Pedres. Son of Pedro. I had no idea about that. <laughs> In fact, most of those easy endings um, from Spanish names are from um, mean son of something. Hmm. I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's my that's my fourth last name. Because you know, in Spain, we like we get our first last name for our dad, our second from our mom, then our third, this our dad second, and so on. So it's my, my mom's second, so my fourth, you know. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. It, it can be really, when people use their f entire full names in Spanish, because most people on a daily basis just use their father's and mother's last name, like Sanz Alcala or, mm -hmm. or, or Trujillo Perez or something like that. But if, if you were to do it right, you'd use all these <laughs> right. well, Like legal, doc legal documents and things like that, you know, it's like, oh my yeah, gosh. You know. It's actually endless, but obviously we need two. I mean, we use two when it comes to, yeah, like legal documents and so on. Anyway. All right, Bill. So, yeah, that was wonderful. Like, uh, I think that the part about research and facts, it's, it's really going to help a lot of people because I, I, still, I still have to talk with a lot of people that, you know, they understand comprehensible input is what's really helping you out, right? Right. But they still think some conscious grammar study is necessary. Right? If, if I can, if, if that helps at all, I'll, I'll end with this because I know we have to wrap up here. But I, I've done a series of books for ACTFL, American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. They're very, very short books. And I did them on purpose. It's, again, I'm one of those few researchers who wants to talk to teachers. Mm -hmm. And my first book was called While We're on the Topic, and it's about basic principles for language teaching that, that are insights from research. Um, and then the second book I did um, is called The Nature of Language, A Brief Guide to What's in Our Heads. 
And I'm doing a book right now with my colleague, uh, Russ Simonson, called Acquisition in a Nutshell, a Primer for Teachers. That will come out sometime in 2022. But that's that middle book, The Nature of Language, that people might want to look at. Because what I do in that book is show how textbook real, rules just aren't real. <laughs> and paradigms, charts aren't real. And I break things down like rules in French and show how they really work and rules in Spanish and even Japanese and, and I take different languages and so on. Um, and, and the whole idea is to arm teachers with some basic, very basic knowledge that language isn't what we think it is. Um, and what's in our heads isn't this stuff. And so if you really want to have a innovation in language teaching, You've got to abandon your ideas about what you think is, is the learners are. Because here's the, here, I'm going to, one more comment. Yeah, sure. One of the words we have to drop from our, our professional speak is internalize. Learners do not internalize language. They create language in their heads. They do not internalize rules. They do not internalize sounds. They do not internalize words. They create language and it evolves over time in their heads. So that word of, inter if we get rid of that word internalize and get people to understand learners don't internalize anything. What they do is they get bits and pieces of data over time. And from these little bits and pieces of data, they create language and what they create then itself evolves. Mm. So that's my, that's my parting words. <laughs> Get rid of the word internalize, and that might help you think a little bit more about yeah. what actually is going on in learners' heads. So, yeah, that's wonderful. Again, yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, thank you so much, Bill. That was thank you. Super helpful. I'm, I'm sure to to a lot of people. You can let me know. You can give me the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you know, I encourage anyone to just comment below, whatever okay. question, comment, opinion, whatever. We'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. And uh, I uh, wish you all the success in your podcast. So thank you. Okay. It. Yeah, I'm even, like, you, even though I'm sort of leaving the profession behind and doing full time fiction writing, I'm still always willing to talk to language teachers. I'm not going to do any more research, but I'm always willing to talk to language right, teachers. Right. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I mean, I, I love it. I love the whole process, like language learning and teaching. And I'm just enjoying this conversation so much because you know you're always gonna learn new things and things that you did <clears throat> that you didn't think of yourself and just yeah. You know. And you know the feedback I'm getting, people are you know they're enjoying them as well and they're helpful because we're spreading the word and you know <laughs> you can learn languages. You know it, you're not gonna do it in in, in two months. <laughs> Spoiler alert, right? <laughs> Um, but it's, 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 um, you know, it's, um, it's a process that you can enjoy and, you know, that, that's what I do on a daily basis. And I love every minute of it. Good for you. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to everybody out there for listening to us. Bye-bye. Bye, Bill.